Recording in progress. Make sure to incorporate it. Hey, Marianne, I know you always have some questions. As you say, happy belated birthday, Marianne. Thank you so much. Oh, I did not I forget. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. I want to count backwards, though. No, <laughs> we do it with grace. We sure do. I, like, fine. I'm with Christy. Right. Yeah, I'm with Christy. <laughs> I'm no, I don't want to go backwards. My daughter's in high school. Like, that's the last place I want to be. <laughs> Same. Agreed. Agreed. Same. Same. <laughs> hey, Swati. Great to see you. Great to see you too. I'm so excited. Hi, Hi. Hi, Christy. I'm so excited. Thanks for doing this today. Yeah, I think it's a really, I mean, you can see the number of people that are joining. There's lots of uh, interest in this topic. And I, you know, Vincent, Christy, and I really want to make sure that we address the questions that brought you here. So please don't hesitate. Go ahead and put in, um, put into chat. I see some of the, uh, some people have already started doing that. So that's great. Go ahead and put in the chat the questions that you're hoping to get answered today. Or just say hello. Tell us where you're from. Uh, works too. Mohammed, good to see you. Thanks for joining today. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Mohammed never sleeps. It's true. <laughs> I, I can I can personally uh, vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, still early. It's it's five p.m. here, so still early. This is actually like a normal time for you. Yeah, for once, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So don't be shy as you're thinking about the questions. And if uh, Vincent, Christy, and I say something that you have additional questions to, uh, the AppEQ team will be monitoring the chat and letting us know that you have those questions. So I know it's you know early for those of us on the West Coast. So as your juices get flowing. Uh, go ahead and put in the questions and uh, let us know because really we want to make sure that this is a valuable session for you. So make sure to send us your questions on chat and then we'll make sure to address it. All right, Vincent, I think we're officially five after. You want to kick it off for us? Sure. Um, thanks everyone for joining the webinar. Uh, I'll have Rajat, uh, the co-founder of AppEQ, do the introductions or opening the, the webinar, and I'll let Sandy and uh, Christy introduce themselves after. Right, Jet, would you sure, mind sure. to open it? Sure. Yeah, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining today. It's a great pleasure to host you all for this webinar. Uh, CS leadership uh, is something which is very uh, deep in what we are building at APQ, and, and the whole uh, ownership on customer success leadership to drive uh, customer success teams, as well as to propagate the customer success mindset across the organization is something which we are uh, deeply working on. And it's an honor to have Christy and Sandy uh, today to share their experiences. I would request uh, all of you to make this session interactive. Please uh, post your questions in the chat. We would love to have your videos on. Uh, and uh, please uh, raise your hands or uh, ask your questions. So yeah, over to you, Vincent. Thanks, Rajat. Again, welcome everyone for joining the webinar. Uh, so this webinar, uh, this is about, we would like to share uh, some of the best um, experiences that, that we had running uh, customer success organizations. So the webinar is all about inspiring success and what, um, and what the best customer success leaders do differently. So I have with me, Sandy Yu, and Christy Paul Teruso. So Sandy, uh, Christy, mind if you could be able to share something about yourself and uh, if you could be able to share uh, about your journey and what is your pet peeves about in terms of leadership. Let's our audience care about that. Um, would you mind to go first, Sandy, and then Christy after? Hey, good morning, everybody. I think it's still morning. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody from around the world. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Sandy Yu. I'm the growth executive for Revenue CCO. And what we do is we identify problems that the pain points that your customers have, uncover them for you, and then fix them. 
And that's, I've been, I have 20 years of big tech experience in Oracle, Cisco, Pricewaterhouse, and, and I'm bringing that solution to uh, new companies and new verticals. So excited to be here. Leadership is very close to my heart and excited to be doing this with Vincent and Christy. Thanks for having me. Great. My name is Chrissy Feltaruso. I'm currently the Chief Customer Officer at Client Success. We are a customer success management solution. So we help our customers in what we say manage new to renew. Um, I've been in the customer success space for about 12 years in B2B hyper growth, hyper growth SaaS companies, um, building, scaling, and transforming teams. Prior to that, I spent a decade of my career in marketing. And so I uh, love to leverage what I've learned in marketing and apply it to customer success today. There's a lot of transferable skills and uh, a lot of great ways to use that in support of our customers at scale. So very excited to be here. Um, I have had some great experiences and some interesting experiences as a leader. And I'm excited to share a lot of those learnings with you all today. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Sandy. All right, just to kick this uh, webinar off, since we started about sharing our experiences about, uh, toward customer success, I know each of us has our own um, has our own path. Sometimes this is something that we choose. Sometimes this has been assigned to us when we started our journey. I am keen to understand your experience, Christy, because you started about in marketing and uh, Sandy's all started in a different um, career. So how did you, uh, how did the two of you end up in customer success and how does that kind of, uh, that career path actually shape your perspective in terms of uh, where, when you lead a team and you decide I should have, uh, take a different career or decisions to make in terms of uh, leading the team, if you will. Yeah, I mean, uh, I loved my my first 10 years of my career in marketing. I thought I was going to go be a CMO or a chief digital officer. That was really where my passion lied. Um, but interestingly enough, I had been using a technology called Bright Edge at a few different companies in marketing. And so Bright Edge is a search engine optimization platform. They help companies get found in search, right? And doing all the research behind that. And I had used them at two different companies and they were based in San Mateo in California and had wonderful experiences with them. And eventually I was like, hey guys, you need to open an office in New York. Like all of the search agencies are out here. Like you need to be present out here. I'm like, but if you do hire me. Um, and so um, they did inevitably open an office in New York and they did also inevitably hire me. And so while I had no customer success experience, I had all of this subject matter expertise. I was not only a customer of theirs, I had been in the search space for so long that I was peers with all of their customers and really understood how to drive the value from their technology. So for me, it was an easy transition as a subject matter expert, but it was a difficult one into tech. Um, I will tell you the number of acronyms that we love to use, the, the just everything, listen, everything about tech was so different from where I had been coming from that there was a huge learning curve for me. And honestly, like the fear factor was probably on my face every single day, sitting in rooms with these folks that grew up in Silicon Valley, understanding what this world was. And it's so foreign to me, um, but had tremendous success doing that. And honestly, most of what I found that I love about work has been through my journey in customer success. And almost everything I've learned about leadership has been during this period as well. Um, I did have a, I was fortunate enough to lead a lot of different teams while I was in marketing. So I had gone as far as a director level and my career path there. So I had started that early journey in leadership, but it wasn't really until, you know, the past decade or so in customer success that I really get to elevate myself as a leader and apply a lot of the learnings um, from my career to, to the practices I take when leading organizations. Sandy? Great. Wow, that's quite a journey, Christy. <laughs> Lots of twists and turns. I would say for me as well, uh, exactly the opposite of you. I actually started my career in tech. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Don't you in live in San Mateo? <laughs> I live in San Mateo, which is a town that nobody knows, but it's just south of uh, just I know it. San Francisco <laughs> Airport. Right. I know you mentioned that Bright Edge is over there. Um, so that's why that's why I started. I grew up in San Francisco, one of the few natives here, like literally middle school, high school, and all that. Um, so I grew up in Silicon Valley, and tech is, is is everywhere. That's all we have, right? You can't even find a job that's not in tech. So I started my career at Oracle. Uh, was there was, you know, twenty years ago, there was no such thing 
as customer success. It was probably account management, maybe it was implementation. Um, so I started my, oh, Ashley, did you have a question? Mm. No, okay. Um, so I started in tech at Oracle where I was, you know, it's it was I was in alliances finance, um, and I studied business, so I got a job where I was able to meet with a lot of customers who had to pay Oracle support fees. So you think a database company could do that digitally, yeah. but no, they had to hire a team of um, big. At the time, it was big ten, big ten consultants and executives to go out and making sure that customers were customers were paying enough support fees to Oracle. But that's how I started um, with my career in that role. And that means every role since then, it's been customer facing. And so I went from there at Oracle to PricewaterhouseCoopers, where I really expanded in terms of my scope. I traveled globally for four years with them. Um, they took me to like the best places. <laughs> I got to go to Sweden. I got to go to Belgium. Really fun. Highly recommend that. If you can get a job as a as a consultant that's traveling, maybe a little bit tougher now with the current situation, but but I did that, and then again that was customer facing. But that was really the first time I started thinking about business development as a manager at Price Waterhouse. That was part of responsibility, and then I moved that to yeah. a sales role, like completely sales, carry the bag, talk to the customer, have ownership for numbers. Um, and so for a professional service, I jumped to sales and then I went to Cisco to do strategy and partnership and channels. And then finally at Oracle in product management, but throughout the theme throughout is always customer facing and th they didn't call it customer success, but it was about making sure that customers got value in whatever it is that we did. And so that's where uh, I, you know, had the opportunity to lead teams globally and um, and also really help them understand, bring that customer perspective in and really help the teams with the mindset, with the strategies, with the tactics uh, and making on how to make the tough decisions. I know all of us in CS are overburdened with everything, right? Like we are, we are the last stop for, hey, when, when no one knows who knows where this goes, it goes to CS. So um, excited to have this conversation with all of you. Looking forward to sharing kind of some of the strategies I've uh, helped my team to navigate um, and be resilient. Vincent. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Christy. Yeah, I agree with you, Swati. Um, if you look at the customer success leaders right now at different organizations, they, they didn't actually start it. Uh, at, at the customer success role, uh, they are really they they started a different role in the organization and they have grown that much. All right. So um, as we know, we're now in in we we we're, we're now living in a different times. So you know, 10, 10 to fifteen years ago, doing customer success is quite different. So we have now um, a whole different array of customer success tools and sets. But I also like to understand uh, on your experience. Um, because somehow we, we also adore um, uh, someone that give us, you know, take the chance for us to do the customer success thing. But if you're going to draw the map in terms of the qualities and attributes of being a cost of a great customer success leader, uh, I'd like to understand uh, in your both experience, what do you think are the key qualities of, of, of a good customer success leaders? And how would, how would you differentiate yourself from the rest of the particular world? Christine, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I'm not going to rattle off a whole list because I'm sure Sandy and I are going to have a lot of overlap. So Sandy, why don't we do this little back and forth game where I kind of, I go, you go, because or else yeah. one of us will just rattle off all of the same items. How, how about all right, that? Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to lead with transparency. Um, one of the things that I have come to value as somebody who's been led uh, by, by dozens of leaders in my career are the ones that were most transparent with me. And that could be transparency around the business, about expectations, about my performance, right? 
a leader who is just willing and open to sharing information has always allowed me to be my best version of myself, right? Whether that is ways to improve my performance, whether that is driving alignment towards business goals and strategies. So one of the things that I've tried to pride myself in is being a very transparent leader. Now, at times I probably toe the line of being overly transparent and I just can't help myself, but I want my team to feel like they know as much as possible so they can be effective in their day to day. Um, what I have found is that the absence of a narrative, guess what? People are going to create one. So when people aren't clear on what's happening or what they're expected to do, they're going to fill in the blanks themselves. And when they do that, right, sometimes it's just misaligned. And that's where you get that misalignment from. So I've found that transparency really helps to combat that. And it's something that I try to focus on a lot with my organizations. All right. That's awesome. I think relating to transparency, um, for me, it's providing clarity for your team. Uh, someone, uh, Pankaj, on the chat just asked, how do you prioritize to do proactive or reactive? I think it's very important for leaders to, uh, especially for CS leaders, as I mentioned in my intro, there's a lot of conflicting priorities. It's very important for leaders to provide that clarity for the team, provide that clarity for uh, the cross-functional leadership to say, what is it that we can do and we, we can do best? So I think clarity is, is another, is another thing really tied into transparency, right? So next you go. All right. Empowerment. Um, I have, I have been led by leaders who love to micromanage and overly control the work that we do. And I think everyone's probably had an experience, a leader like that. And I guess, guess what? They're probably an early leader too in their professional career because we don't know better, right? We probably move from individual contributors into leadership roles and we want everyone to do what we did. And so we're so, we're so tightly wound around controlling that. Well, let me tell you, that's probably the worst thing you can do as a leader. So what I have found to be very effective is empowering my teams, right? So we talked about clarity. We talked about transparency. Well, if you can provide those things for your team, right? Set good expectations, be very clear on what they are supposed to be doing you're, you're in control of building these teams, right? You're the one hiring these folks. They should be the best person to sit in that seat. Well, empower them to do the work you hired them to do. Not only does that create a great experience for them, it empowers them to learn and grow as an individual. But guess what? As a leader, you get to go and do your job. Um, you don't want to spend all of your time micromanaging and following up with people. I need to be driving strategy. I need to be leading out in my organization. And I can't do that if I'm overly focused on what my team is doing day in and day out very tactically. I'm very big on empowerment. I want my team to feel like they've got a safe place to fail forward, learn and grow. And I'm all about that empowerment. Now, sometimes maybe I take it again a little too far because that's what I do. I take everything too far. Um, but the <laughs> over empowerment is maybe like, I'm like, no, you got this. And then I forget to check in all the time and make sure that they're good. Um, so find a nice balance there, but empower your people. Yeah. That would be my second. Yeah. Uh, Christy, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. Having that growth mindset and empowering your team. CSN. To... All India CSN. Hey, Artie, Artie, can you mute? Thank you. Um, I totally agree with that. And I think the next one, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you and I wonder, these are really qualities of good leadership. And I'm trying to think, of, is there something specific about, about, CS leadership that we need to pay attention to. And I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that there is one, but the one that comes to mind after empowerment is, is I think relating to that, but it's really empathy, right? So as CS leaders, our empathy has to go far. We have to have empathy for our team. We have to have empathy for our customers. We have to have empathy for our uh, for our cross-functional leaders. And I think that's particularly important um, because one of the things I think that's really helped me is that I actually have been in all the different roles, right? I've been in marketing, I've been in products. So it's, it's really, it's much easier for me to say, I hear your pain. I know you, what your KPIs are trying to, you know, have releases. If we're talking about product management, right? Having releases. And, and so, but this is how I can help you um, actually get to better releases, choose better features to release for the customer. And here's the customer data. So I think having empathy 
for our customers and our employees and and having the empathy, then empowering them, providing clarity and having a transparency. So it's the whole package. All right, I'm gonna give my last one, Sandy. I think that you probably have one more follow up on this one. That way we round it out with a nice even number of six. I'm gonna go with problem solving skills, right? Like as leaders, we are in the seats that we are and it's an honor to sit in those roles, but we have to make hard decisions all day, every day. And again, it is a privilege to be able to have the problems that we have to solve. But yeah. you have to be able to be very forward thinking, being able to be creative. We have to have those solution solution mindsets. And so I'm going to say that as a leader, I am I do think that an important skill to have is the ability to problem solve, because whether you're problem solving in helping your employees, helping your business, helping your customers, it is just innately something that we're doing day in and day out and something I think you need to be very well versed in. Yeah, I'm trying to think, is it a skill set? Vincent, for the last one, do you want a skill set or a or a characteristic of a leader? Because I think those are two different things. Yeah, I'll go with with, with characteristic because it's because it's something that, that that you could learn, something that you could yeah. be able to uh yeah. do. Yeah, but go so ahead, the, Cindy. The last one that I will close with is really resilience. And that's what we're here to one of the things that that we're going to be talking about here is resilience. And it, it is definitely something you learn over time. Resilience, honestly, comes from failing a lot. Um, I've failed a lot in my career, um, made lots of mistakes. I made a big expensive mistake just uh, two weeks ago. Um, and it's about the ability to, uh, for yourself, uh, have some compassion for yourself. You need to have compassion first, then you can have resilience. And to have resilience, to, to lead the team when, you know, unfortunately there's some reduction in force. Unfortunately, a product didn't get sold. Maybe you got acquired or maybe it's a good exit. There's a lot of challenges as for the CS organization, you know, just being humans actually. Um, so I think resilience is something you cultivate, but remember that resilience comes from failing. So if you are trying to be perfect all the time, it's, it's, it's hard to learn that important, important characteristic and trait uh, if you don't fail. So um, I would say the last one, I would love to leave you all be resilient, knowing that when you fail, it's just building on your resilience. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Henny. Yeah, those are a good characteristic that you guys named. And I, and I wholeheartedly believe that without those characteristics or inherent capability, we're not able to lead a team much as you know to lead the team if you will all right there is one questions on the audience that stood out for me uh do we have a yesha khan uh do, would you want to ask your questions to christy and sandy a yesha can can you hear me All right, maybe later on. Actually, the questions uh, I guess I asked, uh, if you don't mind, is how could you be able, can you talk about actual or factual transparency as well as emotional transparency? And how do you achieve that as a CS leader? Danny, you want to take that first? Yeah, yeah. How do you achieve emotional transparency? Whew. I think that's a tough one. Um, I just heard a I just heard a story where the CEO, uh, the CEO came and you know it's a I think it's a startup maybe like three hundred people went in at all hands said to everybody look we only have six months of cash left I don't know if anyone can relate to this <laughs> we only have six months of cash left if we don't get this product out. Or whatever there was a milestone that had to hit um we all have to we all have to go home this is it so the the ceo meant to meant to you know like energize and ignite everybody but that completely backfired um uh, people started quitting because they 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 need stability they they need to put food on the table for for their families so i don't think that was appropriate <laughs> to do that. And, and so it's a tricky thing, right? Like you have to identify the audience. I think 
what he meant to do was to energize, like, look, uh, we still have, you know, we still have a good runway and we, but we need to deliver this because of this. And so I think transparency um, is important, but how you deliver the message and Christy, as a marketing person, I would love your perspective on this. As a marketing person, you have to assess the audience and, and really think through the impact of what you're going to say, because it took them another, I think, three months to backfill the people. And so I think I do think it's important to be transparent, uh, but also it's got to be uh, the appropriate message for the right audience. I think there's a big follow up on that, too. It's that it's the how, the when, the where, right? Like it's answering all of those questions because you know, perhaps there's certain messages that are better delivered one-on-one -on -one with certain employees, right? And in the privacy of that and being able to solicit feedback and have an engaging dialogue or the timing of when that information is shared or to the extent of how much detail you're providing. Now, I don't know that I'd ever get in front of my company and, and openly just say like, we've only got six months of run room because to me, like that just screams like, hurry up and get out of here because I, again, to your point, right? Like I need to, I need to, you know, uh, provide for my family and I don't have the luxury of, of riding this wave with you, right? I need to know that I will have a job in six months, seven months, eight months. So you have to be careful about how those messages will be received. Um, so I, I agree with you, Sandy, right? There is a balance there. And I think you need to take into consideration the how, the where, the, the what, the when, um, you know, certain things I think are reserved for the executive leadership team, right? I, again, if you're all, if you all have the privilege of leading organizations, there is some information that is being shared with you that you're privy to that doesn't need to make its way beneath and follow through the organization, right? So you have to understand what that balance is of where that information needs to start and stop. Um, and it is, it's a very delicate balance. Yeah. And I just want everybody on this call to know that that's not an easy balance. <laughs> that, that judgment, that judgment of what's appropriate to whom uh, develops over time. Um, and I would say uh, practice. So how do you practice uh, messaging? Go with some trusted friends. You know, I have a lot of trusted friends who are on this call today that I go to regularly to say, this is the message that I, I plan to share. What do you think? Right. So practice makes permanent learned that from my kids, uh, not, not perfect because it's never going to be perfect. You're never going to get right a hundred percent of time, but what you want to do is over time, kind of dial it more towards right more of the time than wrong. Like you never want to make that mistake that the CEO example that I share with you, but it is okay to let your, let your team, let your peers know that, Hey, I am, I am not sure the right thing to do. Um, and I think in terms of transparency, if you're leading a team that's just been impacted, you're talking to the people that are left, I think it's really important to be transparent about how you feel as a human, right? I, 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 I sometimes leaders, I've, I've been with leaders when we've gone through difficult situations and they're very stoic. They're like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And that kind of um, Susan David uh, this really nice job talking about uh, false and toxic positivity. That's a real thing too, right? If you are just being positive all the time, that's not being that's not being authentic. And your team is not going to be like, are you just disconnected from reality? And so, so it, that's when you can be transparent. Like, look, I feel, I feel so sad that we lost half of our team. Or, you know, or like, I think, I think it's okay to, to be human, to let, to let your team know that you are impacted by these negative things instead of like, Hey, it's okay. We're going to make it because that's not reality. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Christy. Um, so over time, I've also seen that as a customer success leader, you also need to be mindful of what is going on around us. That includes being adaptive to the change. But one thing that um, that as, as a customer success leader, is we also wanted to make sure that the customers do not suffer but whatever changes or decisions we're going to make. There is one question from the audience I would like to take, if you don't mind. Um, this is for, came from Jane Steph Stefanova. Are you there? Would you like to ask your questions directly to Christy and Sandy? Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm here. Thank you for addressing my question. 
I actually asked two, uh, uh, one about the acquisition and another one is about the commercial pressure. Uh, can you specify which one did you mean by raising for me? Ask the one that's most important to you, Jane. For me, okay. For me, actually, uh, the most important is acquisition one. So I will really want to take the opportunity to ask that one. So we are rapidly growing and acquiring companies. And I would like to learn uh, what is the best practices or best advice or maybe some cases that you can suggest of how to align the customer success strategies because this is different markets, different countries, different culture, and completely different service levels that being offered uh, to the customers in these companies. Um, so how to align, how to keep customers not churn and keep the team motivated and aligned in a short term, of course, because there is also a commercial pressure to uh, uh, process all this. Thank you. Christy, do you want to go first? And I'll yeah, ask? sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a step. We'll do the best that I can. Um, all right. So my thoughts around this, um, I don't know that I've probably been exposed to as many acquisitions, probably Sandy, as you have in your career, just given the organizations that you've worked, yeah. you've worked with. Um, but I'll give you kind of the hindsight of the organizations that I work with different scale, right? We're talking mid-size hyper growth, uh, sub hundred million in revenue, right? Like those types of companies who have either been acquired or have acquired other companies and how we've merged the customer success organizations and strategies through those, those acquisitions. The first thing is communication. Um, we've had to be very clear on communicating to your employees, right? And com this also includes communication to your customers. And this is your new customers as well, right? Everyone needs to understand what is happening. The second is being clear on what your strategy is. Now, you have to also understand with acquisitions, nothing goes as planned. Nothing goes as designed. It is messy, but you have to have something in place, right? There has to be a strategy of what we are ultimately working towards, how and why. And so being able to design a strategy and clearly articulate that to the folks that need to understand what that is. Again, it's going to be your employees and it's going to be your customers. I am a big believer that people like when change happens with them, not to them. So in order to bring people along for that change management journey that they're about to embark on, you have to bring them into the process. So communication and strategy is key. I would say uh, uh, to kind of follow on that with a third note, the things that we've done really well, again, it's kind of tagging on from the communication in the, in the forefront is making sure that communication is consistently happening over that journey because things will change, things will be bumpy and being able to make sure that you have constant communication. Communication can't be a one and done thing like, oh, we've told everyone what we're doing and what our intentions are. Great. See ya and hope that it pray for the best. Um, it has to be consistent, right? So being able to have continuous dialogue about what is happening, being nimble and being flexible, other big things. You cannot be rigid. I will tell you, having gone through, again, working in acquisitions in, in smaller organizations, I don't know, Sandy, you're going to talk about it in large ones, but yeah, yeah. It, it is messy. We're under-resourced, understaffed, under-skilled. A lot of folks are going through this for the very first time. You don't have a, you know, a, a strategy leader, an operations leader who's done this 30,000 times. For the, for the most part, when you're in these smaller businesses, you're, you're navigating this with folks who have never done this and they're learning on the fly and they're doing the best they can. Trying to be too rigid around how and why and when things have to happen is going to create more chaos. You have to have some level of flexibility and agility to make sure that this is happening, uh, happening well. The last thing that I'll pass it over to Sandy, be empathetic to everyone involved. Um, as Sandy hit on empathy as a, a characteristic of good leaders. Um, this is hard. M&A is tough. It is tough for everybody. And it's not something that's done in two months, three months, four months. In fact, most of the M&A that I've been through, it probably takes, at least in my experience, it was at least over 18 months before things felt like less uncomfortable, uh, which is a long time to feel this kind of disarray because you've got products that are merging, teams that are merging, customer bases, right? All of those variables are trying to come together in this like one holistic ecosystem. And being empathetic to that, right? Having good conversations with your employees, with your customers, getting and collecting that feedback. What is going well? What isn't going well? And addressing things in real time with folks. Um, I can't give too many specifics, but in, in a recent experience, navigating something similar and, you know, I've got team members coming to me who are very expressive of their concerns, right? Because especially if your customer success teams, 
I'm, am I getting new customers? Do I have to learn new products? Am I responsible for selling this? They're not hearing any of the good things. They're not hearing how exciting this is for the business. They're not hearing the possibilities of growth. They're hearing, oh my gosh, as a frontline professional, how is my day-to-day -day changing? What more work am I being tasked with? Am I being compensated? Is this being thought out? Like they're thinking about the personal impact. So if you are not being empathetic and having the appropriate dialogues with your team, you are going to miss out on that. And I guarantee you, you will have employee churn as a result of it. So Sandy, I'm gonna pass it over to you. You have big, big world experience. Yeah. Uh, enlighten us all. But those are my experiences in, in my ecosystem. Again, companies sub 100. Million. It's so interesting, Christy, yeah. for, for you, um, for the company, you actually are much closer to M&A, you know, at Oracle and Cisco, where we did a lot of M&A, we have hundreds of people that actually do that. So, so I actually don't, <laughs> don't get you guys to, have the army of professionals who we know have how the, to do it <laughs> that are just doing M&A. So my experience in terms of uh, kind of merging and expanding teams, Jane, is actually about when we actually add a product to our, to our portfolio. So it's very common for us to say, Hey, you know, you guys are one business unit, but now you're going to have this other thing. And so when I was in uh, CX marketing, um, what we actually added additional product called uh, data platforms to the marketing portfolio. So when that happens, what we need to do, the leaders really need to get together and talk about what are the joint goals. And what is that customer perspective? How the customer is going to feel about it? How are the customers going to benefit from it? So when, when the marketing platform incorporate the CDP, the leaders really have to get together and specifically talk about what's in it for the customer and actually set the goals. What are, what are the value metrics? What is the time to value for the new customer? And how are we going to get to market? And so our team didn't do that in a silo. So we, we made that this, you know, make sure we got together to talk about those things and then work with the marketing to say, Hey, what is the marketing message you have? And then every function, you know, whether it's marketing, whether it's sales, whether it's success, you have to have that conversation and orient it towards what's in it for the customer and what are the operational things that are similar because why do companies do that? They want to combine resources, right? Uh, it doesn't mean anyone's going to be, be let go, but they want to have that synergy. For example, the product development team want to be together to say, how do we build a, instead of a point solution, now we have more of a platform story. And so I think when you start, and, and I worked a lot with the global teams, um, the, the needs of the customer in each of the individual regions are very different than the big North American market. And so it's important to take that in consideration and look at the growth opportunities of the region as opposed to prioritizing just North America. Thank you so much, guys. Really very inspiring. And Thank feel, you for feel free, feel free to obviously reach out to us, you know, one-on-one, -on -one we can uh, talk further about it. Thank you. It's a lot of experience. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jane, for asking good questions. All right, there's also another question uh, I don't want to miss on the audience, but just I'll, I'll give the context both Sandy and, and uh, Christy. So part of a role of, of a customer success leader is we also need <clears throat> to ensure that our employees are motivated, and this is done through coaching. Now, Alexandra Hall, I mind if you would like to ask your questions to Sandy and Christy? Hi, uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm just keen to to find out. I've been in my role for probably just over a year, so you would call what I'm relatively a new manager. Um, and I'm really keen to. I've learned a lot, but I feel I'm at the point where I need to grow in my coaching skills to better benefit my team and help them. How have you been able to do that over your careers? Because I'm sure you've had to guard and coach and support your teams in their own careers and growth. Since you went first last time, I'll, I can I can take this one. Yeah, first. that's why I'm silent, Sandy. This is your your <laughs> go <around. laughs> no, no. And so I think I think uh, in, instead of just learning on the job, actually I would learn from thought leaders. Uh, I real highly recommend Brene Brown. Uh, she's a, a you know, great author. I see a lot of nodding heads. So Brene Brown writes a lot about uh, vulnerability and also shame. 
But when people are learning and growing, there's a lot of that going on. And how do you identify it? How do you teach your team to be brave? So Brene Brown, I love. Adam Grant, I love. I think those two thought leaders specifically, uh, and I have a shortcut for learning. Uh, reading a book is really hard for me because I'm driving a lot. So I tend to listen to podcasts and audiobooks. And podcasts is a shortcut way to learning because when you listen to the authors of their book, they tell you like the, the, the top three nuggets, right? Because they don't have a whole book to tell it. So they have to tell it to you in like half an hour or like 45 minutes. So if you're interested in exploring some authors, you know, a thought leadership on how to coach, how to build teams, how to build resilient and courageous teams, I recommend that you do that. And it's about learning that and also really watching great leaders. Um, early in my career, I didn't, uh, I was obviously an individual contributor and I had this misconception about what, what leadership is. Leadership is someone that didn't look like me someone that was not happy, that was not, I mean, I mean, not, not happy. Like I, I felt like I was too outgoing and too friendly to be a leader. Um, and so I think for me, as I become a leader, I can be leader my own way, but also letting my team know that. And, and coaching comes from uh, observing, right? So I, I, you know, definitely want to kind of learn more about why you think you need more coaching, but it's about being, for me, it's about paying attention and really asking the question. So what I always ask my team is, where do you want to go, even if it's out of this team? Because if, if your team have this understanding of what they're working towards, that is working towards, Christy mentioned this too, is, you know, we're human first, right? We want to grow as individuals. Maybe I want to be a, a you know, a manager one day. So asking your teams, and it's harder if you have larger teams. So when I had second level managers, my, my leaders to do that for their individual employees. So it's, it's, it's a mindset that you have to be listening. And also, so two things to, to find opportunities for them, right? You know, you're not just asking, but you're actively thinking, okay, you wanted to do this. Maybe you could, you know, you could do a stretch assignment for the product team. Maybe you can do a stretch assignment. And that's where you leverage your interpersonal network to say, oh, look, you know, um, Susie really is really interested in this. Would you consider letting her either observe, they're shadowing a lot of different opportunities, find opportunities for your team to really stretch and grow their muscles. Uh, and then, and they feel motivated, right? They are like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm learning. I'm excited. I'm moving towards my goal. Um, and also, one final thing I'll pass it over to uh, Christy is catch them in the act of doing something right. Oftentimes we only come to them when we have constructive criticisms. Uh, really catch them in the act of doing something right and give them that feedback right away. Um, so those would be my recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, I really resonated with you saying you felt you were too happy and that to be a manager because I am that you know, you know, when I've arrived. So um, <laughs> I love that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. So I'll add on to, to Sandy's point is because I'll, I'll say like a yes. And um, I would say if you want to be very deliberate about growing your your skills around coaching and leadership, I would start by one having a conversation with your employer. Um, right. Go to your manager, go to your HR. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes companies will make the investment in leaders to help grow them and put you into formal pro programs around leadership, training, coaching. So ask the question, even if they don't have a formal program today, it is likely that your employer will want to invest in you. And so I always say, ask, what's the worst they're going to say is no. Um, but asking might actually open the doors to them making that investment. And so I'm a big advocate of finding some formal programs. I love all of the resources that are on the web, but for me, I'm kind of like a hands-on learner. Um, like I like to be in a classroom style with a teacher, hold me accountable, do the work. Um, and that's how I learn best. And so everyone's got their own learning styles. So for me, I'd like to find different programs that are going to help me develop the skills through a very methodical program. Um, so ask your employer to see if they'll help. If not, remember, these things are investments in yourself. 
right? So don't, I, I, if your employer is not willing to cover it, it is something to consider, you know, maybe saving up if you don't have the funds for it right now. But if it is something you want to invest in, it's a great investment, right? I'm sure many of us went to college. We've made investments in our education. This thing of it is like continuous education. Um, and the more you invest in yourself, obviously you will have the ROI there, right? You'll become a better, stronger leader and you'll see that transcend in your career trajectory. So I would say, ask them if they say no, Put away some some peanuts, no more Starbucks drinks, make coffee at home, save your money, go, go uh, participate in a formal program. And there's so many out there. I won't rattle off a laundry list of the ones that I've seen. There are a ton, but find the ones that best resonate with the gaps that you've identified for yourself that you want to fill. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks, always trying for asking us that, that, that questions. All right. Um, another one questions I'd like to get from the audience. I know we have questions that that we would like to to, to discuss, but it's something I, I don't want to miss. Um, so this is from Rob Ken. Are you there? Rob Ken. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Did you have any you... questions to Christy and Sandy? Uh, do you want me to ask that question directly? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, so uh, actually, I'm, the, yeah, I'm in a bit of a uh, situation where I'm trying to figure out how we can. So we have some set up uh, KPIs uh, already uh, set up by the client. And I can see that our product and even uh, like even we have tried like uh, lots of things and our product is not able to achieve those KPIs. And the client is not very happy, obviously. So how do you manage uh, uh, the client in those situations and how you ensure that they don't leave you? I know it's a very difficult thing situation, but I would love to know your advices. I'm sure like many of you have been in that situation where you can see like uh, the product is not able to help your client. So Rob, I'm, I'm going to ask a clarifying question here. So you're telling me you have a customer who is identified with you that your product cannot provide value for them and you're interested in understanding how do you get them to stay? <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. I, I'm going to tell you that's the wrong question to be asking. If your customers can't get value from your solution, those are not the right customers for you to be holding on to. This kind of goes into the bad fit customers and forcing your customers to do things that are unnatural. I, I'm very adamantly against it. It's like folks that hold their customers tied to auto renewal clauses and use that as their renewal mechanism. I, I know that your company probably doesn't want to hear that, but if they want to keep their customers and the product isn't providing value, I think your only path forward is to figure out what product innovation needs to take place in order to have a solution in place that will provide that value and bridge that gap. Other than that, trying to keep your customer by band-aiding something together, I don't think is the appropriate strategy and it's definitely not one that will last long-term. Yeah, 100% agree with Chris. I hope it wasn't like, a very aggressive response. No, it was. Yeah. <laughs> I just I want to be honest. Like, I agree with you, Christy. And my next approach is to get on a call with our product team and I help them understand why this is not being helpful to this client and how we can yeah. figure out a solution uh, for that particular client. Because they have been yeah. really nice with us, those clients, and they are very patient with us. But it's sometimes you've been in that situation, you're being empathetic with them, that this product is really not helping them. Yeah. I mean, even facilitating the conversation between your customer and product directly, if you've got the right folks to have that conversation, just to make sure nothing's lost in translation. But at the end of the day, your product has to meet their needs, right? It doesn't need to meet all of their needs. It doesn't need to do everything the way that they they would like it to do it, but they have to be able to connect value to what your solution is offering. So if that's a big delta, you got to help bridge that or you have to part ways as friends. Yeah. Yeah, and I know, Rob, there's a lot of uh, pressure, right? Th and this is, I think, will be a great one hour topic about how do you how do you go through that, um, have that pressure of you needing to keep the AR and then but this is not a good fit for a customer. Um, so completely agree with Christy on that. We have to part ways. But before you do that, I would I would also suggest let's let's go back. I don't know which level, it's, you know, the buyer often is not the people that are using the tool. And so I think I would go back to the buyer of your customer to say, hey, when you when you signed on with us, what was your vision? And also talk to your talk to do the research for with their sales team. And it is not to say, oh, you sold the wrong customer. Right. But it's to say when you went through that, you know, whether it's six or nine month sales cycle for enterprise sales, maybe even longer, 
what was what was the process? What was, what was the journey that you took the customer on that convinced them our product was the right thing for them? And I think having and and uh, Rob, I mean, you know, we, we would have to kind of kind of dissect it, but is are the people you're talking to the people at your customers that actually bought it? And so if it's not, then you need to go back with your sales team and then go back to, to the buyer to say, what was the vision? How did you have in mind? Because there may be, it's not a problem. It may not be a problem with your product. The problem is the, the problem is between the buyer and the executor. This happened to me. I won't say what company, uh, when, when, when there was that disconnect you know, we took the sales team had a long sales cycle and then now, you know, the post sales team are on it and it turns out it wasn't a right fit. And what happened there was there was a mistranslation about the vision that the, the, uh, the buyer of my customer had and the team that was executing. And there was additional resistance from the team that was executing because they already had a competing product. So it was in their interest to say, you didn't work, you didn't work, you didn't work, right? And, and so this, you don't have exactly what I need because I already have exactly what I need. And I don't need you because I already have exactly what I need. And so I don't know what the specific situation, but you know, one of the scenarios I can imagine is you know, when there's that disconnect. So what we did as a team is went back to the buyer, help them articulate the vision. And this is about building change management into your sales cycle. To make sure that you know when your customers buy, uh, the buyer that buys, you incorporate the people that are going to be using the tool, so you can get those objections early and not after the contract is signed. So for your situation right now, I would say go back to the sales team, and and try to see if we can go and engage with the person that bought it. And if the person you are working with is the person that bought it, like walk them back memory lane. Hey, when you when you first bought it, what what did you what was your vision? You know, how was your company going to be better, faster, different than before our product? Let, let's go back to that and then kind of work backwards. Yep. I'm going to play out another scenario just to, to play the different side of this. It yeah, could please. also be likely. I mean, listen, I don't know what you guys are saying, but we have POC and leadership turnover in like 90% of our customers, right? Because of reducing force changes, new roles, new everything. And so what we're seeing a lot of is that there's new leadership, right? There's new directives, there's new strategy. And so it may not be misalignment from the original purchase process and the ideas and the intent behind when they initially bought it. You could have new leaders in place. You could have new business strategy. You should have, you could have new teams and all of those things need to be considered as well. If that is what you're navigating, you're going to have have to have a very different conversation and it's going to be more of a resell motion and you're going to need to understand how your your technology can provide value in this new ecosystem right with new people new process and, and maybe new infrastructure so these are all things you're going to have to navigate there's no right or wrong way that this is going to play out you have to consider what the situation is specifically for you and this is why i tell everyone there is no one size fits all when it comes to customer success. It looks different everywhere because all of the different variables that we need to consider will determine our strategy and how we play these things out. So just other things to think about in this instance. Well, sure. Uh, thank you so much for your answers. That was a great one. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for asking the questions. All right. So I know we have six minutes more left. So, you know, this is very engaging conversation. I didn't know that we're almost almost top of the hour. Uh, I'll be asking two more questions, then I'll give Sandy and Christy a time uh, to say something about the audience. But um, I think everyone is also looking about um, uh, understanding your thoughts, especially uh, customer success is now changing as opposed to like, like you know, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, if you're going to advise someone who is starting from, from their career to become the, the great customer success leaders, where what advice can you give to them and how do you go into start implementing that, that that suggestions or advice? So depends on where what phase the company is in and kind of where they want to grow, right? So that I think that's, can you narrow that question a little bit for me? Because I don't want to just you know, like give like a blanket. I think we have people who are already leaders, who are aspiring leaders. Uh, it's hard to 
what what are your thoughts, Vincent? Like, what would you like us to address? Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll give two use case, and then maybe uh, Christy and Sally, you could take one of one of that. Let's say for uh, startup companies who have just about uh, how they, they're just getting about 10, 10 to 15 accounts, and then they would like to ensure that uh, the, the products uh, that the product becomes sticky to, to their customers, and they want to make sure that they're doing the right thing in, in their customers. They don't want to change anything, any, any processes, but they would like to build processes within, uh, within the team. So that's the first use case. The second use case is going to be um, if you have the product now that is now used about 100 to 100 customers, how could you be able to elevate and improve that customer experience without losing um, your team resources, if you will? Do you want to take the first use case and I'll take the second, Christy? Sure, sure. Um, and both are very different, very clearly. Um, so if you've got a, a small organization, you're just getting off the ground, right? To, so we're saying sub 20 customers in place. You're you don't have a customer success strategy. You have a customer partnership. And I say that because at this stage, you need to be engaging your customers as partners. You need to be thoroughly understanding their use cases, their needs, how they use your product, what their objectives are. You are almost acting as an extension of their team to learn. So that way, when you are ready to start designing a customer success program, you're designing it outside in and not inside out. And so when I say that, Many organizations design their customer success programs inside out. They're doing these box checky things that they feel like are best practices because they did something in another company that seems to work here and they're going to go implement those things. It's like QBRs, don't get me started. But when you are this early in an organizational stage, you need to be able to partner and learn from your customers, right? And hopefully hone in on who are the customers and what are the profiles of the folks that are going to be the most successful with your product, right? This early stage learning and growing with your customers is going to help you hone in on your ICP. It's going to figure out what value your customers can get from your product. You're going to start to find out what are those repeatable things that we can start doing with customers early. So early stage, you're learning. You're not building. You're learning, you're listening, and you're leaning in. So do all those L's and then start to take that back and start to build out your programs as it's appropriate. Great advice, Christy. I think for uh, the question, Vincent, is like, how do you help your team scale as the customers are using product? Um, I, you know, I think I saw, uh, you know, someone in our network kind of list out all the things that customer success people have have to do. And it it, it feels like you got to do sales thing, you got to do marketing thing, you got to do product thing and you got to do customer success thing. I think it, my suggestion for you, especially when you have a small team, is to be to ruthlessly prioritize. And and but so get together with your with your other functional leaders. So for example, one of the things that we get asked to do a lot is, hey, you know, ask your customer, let's ask your customers for references. Now that takes a long time to cultivate, right? So can we ask? the marketing people to say, look, let me set up an intro call as a CSM, and then you go and try to cultivate and find that use case and write that story. So uh, as, a, as a CS leader of a small team, in order to maximize what your team can do, you need to be, you need to ruthlessly prioritize and then work with the cross-functional team to see if they can support what are what are the things that you feel like you have to do that's actually going to be helpful to their KPIs in marketing in product you know another thing we get asked to do is get Jagdish we can hear you thanks <laughs> anyway uh so i would say ruthlessly prioritize and then get your cross functional team to do the things that are not priority do only th do only the things that only you can do, and then get the other teams to kind of support you as it supports their KPIs as well. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Christy. Again, uh, a minute to go. So again, I'd like to thank Christy and Sandy for taking their time and also for um, for being with us today. Uh, Rajat, I'd like you to close the webinar and say something about. Uh, up EQ, then we, we can close from there. Yeah, sure. Uh, just a last question to Christy and Sandy. Is there any question you would like to take before we close? Uh, or uh, maybe I think so Sandy, you have dropped your LinkedIn. So anybody who has any questions, Q 
please feel free to reach out to Christy and Sandy on LinkedIn with your follow-up questions. Can I just say this has been like one of the most fun conversations like with you, Vincent, Christy, but also with all of you. Uh, so thank you all for being here. I know it's not easy being a CS leader, also not easy being an aspiring CS leader. So we're rooting for you. Let us know how we can help. Yeah, I, to echo Sandy's sentiment there. I mean, honestly, listen, we do we do the hard work. I don't know that there is a, a leadership profile that is tasked with the work that we have to do in the environments that we have to do it. So listen, I will say, I speak to a lot of folks every day. It's hard. Try your best to stay the course, stay positive, build your network, find your, your, your team of allies that you can go to, to not just commiserate, but to listen, learn, and grow together, because that's going to be your, your most important resource that you work to design and develop over time. Yeah. And I think uh, someone on the chat has said that wish they were more, there are more. So follow AppyQ, uh, follow AppyQ, uh, follow Christy. Follow me. Uh, we're attending different, we're hosting different sessions all the time, but AppQ has a great series of uh, sessions that are really geared towards CS. So I uh, really recommend you add follow AppQ. Th thanks, thanks, Christy. Thanks, Andy, for your time. And thanks, everyone, for a wonderful session today. Looking forward for the next one. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.